of injecting equipment. Um, this itself is, as you all know, um, can be broken down into its components. Um, this is some data from, again, rather old data from about 10 years ago, looking at uh, the lending of injecting equipment and the borrowing of injecting equipment and who it was done with. Um, needles and syringes were more likely to be both borrowed and lent to sexual partners than they were to others, but they were also used uh, less frequently with people who were regarded as close friends and less frequently still with casual acquaintances. You're much more likely to do it with sexual partners than with others, um, but you're also much more likely to do it with spoons and with water than you are with the needle and syringe itself. And this is based upon the same data set, but this is looking at people who shared spoons but who did not share syringes. So there were a group of people who were quite, who'd got the message that you mustn't share with others, and they were very careful not to share needles and syringes with others. But in fact, very large numbers of them, about half of them, were sharing uh, spoons uh, with their sexual partners and indeed also sharing it with others. So there are, there are a number of different issues to do with injection risk behaviors here to do with the paraphernalia. Let me move on to treatment outcomes. These are the uh, five-year uh, follow-up data for the NTORS cohort. Um, let me just show you. These are the outcomes for uh, regular heroin use, the percentage of uh, these people who were using regularly at intake at one year and up to uh, the five-year follow-up, there is um, a substantial and encouraging reduction in heroin use at one year, which is uh, substantially maintained and indeed uh, increases slightly over the uh, five-year period. Injecting and sharing behaviors. The Total height of each of these bars is the percentage of people who were injecting at intake and at follow-up, and the yellow bar represents the percentage of people who were sharing injecting equipment, that's any injecting equipment, at um, these follow-up points. There is a similar pattern to that shown for the use of other illicit opiates, namely there's a reduction at one year and the, in, the reduction is maintained over the five-year follow-up period. More importantly, if you look at the uh, sharing behavior, again, although this was uh, a more minority behavior, the, the reduction was, uh, was satisfactory. If, if you choose to look at it that way, it wasn't completely eliminated but it was, uh, more, it was reduced by more than half, and it stayed down over that period. This is the data for the patients who were um, on outpatient methadone programs, and this is the data for the people who were going to the residential programs. The residential programs were a rather mixed group of treatment programs. They included um, specialist um, drug dependence units in psychiatric hospitals. They also included therapeutic communities and they included some of the uh, Minnesota model 12-step uh, programs in the UK. And again, the pattern of reduction is very much um, the same. You get a big reduction amongst the people who were treated at one year and that reduction is certainly maintained and indeed it is uh, added to slightly across the five-year follow-up. So both the previous slide and this one, I think, give encouragement to the view that treatment is also um, a very effective form of harm reduction intervention that we can provide the people uh, when we are concerned about injection risk behaviors. Across time, um, the same number of people continued to um, drink frequently. This should be read in conjunction with what we know about the high rates of uh, 
people who are infected with hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Heavy drinking is not something that you would recommend among people who have these forms of liver disease. There is a group of people um, who just didn't show a good response. This is the block in red. Whereas about um, uh, something like 60% of the sample showed a clearly improved response uh, whilst receiving methadone, there were just under one in five of the patients who showed a poor response. Uh, we've also um, uh, uh, learned from previous speakers that there has been an expansion in uh, methadone, uh, primarily methadone treatment, and to some, some degree of buprenorphine treatment uh, throughout many countries. And parallel with that, we've also seen, uh, based on review by Larney and Dolan, an expansion of um, opioid agonist treatment in prisons. Although the rate within uh, each country of those um, of the availability of opioid uh, agonist therapy is somewhat limited. In the United States, it's estimated fewer than 1% of prison inmates uh, receive opioid agonist uh, therapy. In France, uh, one estimate is at 6.6%, and this is probably uh, buprenorphine, which is somewhat, uh, whereas in most other countries, uh, it is methadone that is provided. And countries with the highest uh, prevalence of, uh, of providing agonist therapy in, uh, in prisons are Spain, Scotland, and Ireland. Advantages of buprenorphine are that it's less restrictive, there are less restricted regulations, more liberal reporting requirements. In the U.S., uh, buprenorphine is described as a, defined as a Schedule three medication, while methadone is Schedule two. And these are classes of, in terms of the level of regulation uh, that drugs have, and I believe a similar designation uh, is in France for both methadone and buprenorphine. Buprenorphine can be taken in the privacy of the patient's home, thus increasing the patient's confidentiality, and the stigma associated with addiction is further concealed, and the patient has a more flexible schedule for employment, education, and activities. And it is uh, comparatively safer than methadone, and by most evidence, the uh, combination, buprenorphine naloxone formulation is considered uh, less likely to be diverted and less abused, and it was that medication, Suboxone, the combination formulation that we used in our study. This is somewhat of an interesting slide, and it, it sort of gives a rationale for why we chose to introduce buprenorphine into a jail setting. You'll see from the second row that uh, approximately 75 percent of the uh, of the sample had been in uh, methadone treatment at uh, Rikers Island, although, although only 50% uh, or fewer than 50% had ever been in a community methadone treatment program. This is somewhat unusual in that these were long-term, these were uh, heroin addicts with a long addiction career. Their average age was around 39 to 41, and although we didn't ask, I don't know if we asked them when they started using heroin, usually that occurs. On this side, slide, we see both uh, pre-release data and post-release data. Prior to patients being uh, discharged from Rikers, we asked them if they intended to continue their agonist therapy at post-release. 92% of patients who were uh, uh, taking buprenorphine said they intended to report to treatment after leaving jail, while only 41% of those maintained on methadone uh, endorse this item. And this attitude, this intention, is consistent with the behavioral evidence at post-release. 48% of buprenorphine-assigned uh, patients reported to a, a buprenorphine provider at post-release, while only 14% of